Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Irina Polanco Ventura and I am Director of Public Health Initiatives for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. I am excited and proud to be joined by my colleagues and partners who you will hear from in just one moment. First, thank you for registering for our program entitled Community Doulas, a vital member of the maternal health care team. We are honored to have Jill Wadnick today as our featured speaker. This educational program is the first of many we plan to host for those who live, work, and give birth in Patterson, New Jersey. Jill will highlight the history of New Jersey community doula programs, the impact of relationship-based care that doulas offer, and lessons learned from other states. The fact that you're here today uh, with us shows your commitment to making childbirth healthier and safer for birthing families, and we want to make sure that those who are not aware of community doulas and their essential role in maternal and infant care have access to this information and are aware of our new Patterson Community Doula Project in partnership with New Destiny Family Success Center and St. Joseph's Health. Before I hand it over to my colleagues, I want to thank our funders, the Henry and Marilyn Taub Foundation, the Burke Foundation, and the Terrell Fund. Without them, this project would not be possible. I also want to express my gratitude to Children's Home Society of New Jersey and all others who have provided us with guidance and support throughout this journey. I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Aurelis Martinez, who will tell you more about this exciting new initiative. Thank you and enjoy the program. Hello, everyone. As Irina stated, my name is Aurelis Martinez, and it is such an honor to say I am the Patterson Community Doula Project Supervisor. I am very excited about this great opportunity and to partner with Destiny Family Success Center, St. Joseph University Medical Center, and other Patterson-based partners to launch this doula project. This project utilizes Health Connect One Community Doula Training Curriculum, which is culturally reflective, community rooted model, I'm sorry, to train local residents who are interested in becoming community doula in Patterson. This will build perinatal workforce and help address maternal and health, health disparities in the city of Patterson and surrounding regions. In doing so, birthing individuals can potentially have healthier pregnancies and birth outcomes. Now I would like to introduce my colleague, Marie Casella, who is the Director of Community Programs at the Partnership. Good afternoon, everyone. It is it's certainly my pleasure and honor to be a part of this project. The things that we will be able to offer to the community of Patterson um, are just wonderful. And I think you'll hear a lot about that from our speakers. And so it's my honor and pleasure, as Irina mentioned, you know, this initiative really is comprised of so many different people and organizations. But I have the honor of introducing two of the most prominent parts and members of this initiative. So first I'll introduce Deborah Katz, who is the director of midwifery at St. Joseph's um, Hospital in Patterson. Deborah. Hi, sorry, there's no picture technology. Um, so I'm the director of midwifery at St. Joseph's. We're a seven midwives um, and we also run a centering program at St. Joseph's. And we are so excited to see this doula project come into fruition. We've been waiting for this for a while and this will truly, truly enhance our program as well as the women giving birth at St. Joseph's. And thank you so much for including us in this project. Now I have the honor of presenting someone to you that most of you know, she, she and her organization are definitely beacons in the community of Patterson. Um, she's a dear friend, just a wonderful colleague, and someone who I definitely am in awe of with all the work that she does and the way she supports the community. Carolyn McCombs, the Executive Director of New Destiny. Carolyn. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. And um, you all have been like family for me, and it's a pleasure um, to be a part of this movement um, that's taking place. And I am just honored to introduce Jill Wadnick. I just gave her a title of champion of doulas 
and healthy birth outcomes. <laughs> Um, because, you know, we, it takes pioneers to do this type of work. Um, and so we're excited to be a part of this. It's, it's going to be, bring such hope um, in ways we can't imagine. Um, so as I introduce Jill, um, I'm, I'm just excited for how she has come to be a part of this. And we're looking to her for support in the future um, as we launch forward. Um, she works on improving maternal health centered in high value, respectful care. She is a Lamont's childbirth educator at Montclair State University, providing technical assistance on community doula programs, centering childbirth as a key life event with dignity. Jill is also passionate about environmental stewardship and linking healthy soil and food justice with improved maternity care. She is a longtime doula and mom of three teenagers in New Jersey, and she works with federal and state projects and has been invited to give testimony about doula care. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Um, the plurality of voices really show what an important moment this is in hearing each other um, and coming to this centering of improving maternity care and through the unique role of doulas. Um, my name is Jill and I just really want to amplify um, the many people named and unnamed and I'm hoping I can just really just read out um, what was said before the Burke Foundation, New Destiny, the Children's Home Society, the Terrell Fund, the Taub Foundation, St. Joe's University Medical Center, um, the Partnership for Maternal Child Health. Um, all of these individuals named and unnamed have such legacy and interest in using community doula care. So I'm really glad to start this conversation. And to me, everything that has been happening on this project has been really intentional. Um, I could actually show you emails that go back 10 years. Um, and then I'm gonna show you other people who were doing this 10 years before that. So I'm asking us, you know, at the end of this, when we all talk to each other, what are we holding um, with intentional collaboration for community doula care? And so sometimes I started anatomy and physiology. And so I remember that baby being held, right? Um, with the ligaments and the uterus. And I remember the infant parent dyad. And that's what we're holding in terms of um, the, the infant parent relationship. But I think because of the partners, because we have Family Success Center, we have the clinical partners, we have WIC, we have an opportunity with intentional collaboration to really acknowledge that this project is community development. And that might be an interesting word because there's so much we, we can go into and, and we will go into. But some of my mentors from Health Connect One um, wrote a book, and I'm not kidding, I, I go everywhere with this book. So this is the book where this is quoted from. Um, so some of my mentors, Ginger Breedlove and Rachel Abramson and Dr. Isaacs from Health Connect One, um, wrote the language that community-based doulas do essential work. Being with another person in her time of need, standing firmly in one's own strength, and helping a person find hers is the ultimate human act. It is the essence of relationship-based work. Strong, caring relationships nurture babies. These same positive relationships keep adults vital and learning. The community-based doula is a community development strategy. And that humbles me. And so I return to the words of Dr. Jim Greenberg, who says, if you care about education, jobs, poverty, or equity, you got to start caring about birth. And that's the joy and the privilege of speaking at this moment. The plurality of people who have been caring and who are continued to do the work of caring to bring birth into the conversation. So I will make, I will fumble towards repair, um, but, and, and want to make sure that my language reflects the way parents talk about giving birth, really acknowledging that I'm going to use a plurality of ways from birthing individuals, moms, parents, partners, elders, 
grandparents. And so we want to just make sure that we're finding the ways that people define themselves giving birth and parenting, because this project is rooted in the acknowledgement that birth has a profound impact, not only on an individual, but on a community. And so when we make mistakes, we will be in the place of also asking for repair and doing this intentional work. I don't know about you, but my job for today was just made a whole lot easier because on December 7th, just three days ago, um, the White House had their Maternal Health Day of Action. And our vice president who has frequently spoken um, and done proposed legislation in support of doula care really amplified the role of doulas in the continuum, right? So we can't have doulas alone from all of the interrelated community and clinical areas of focus. And that's what I love about this project in Patterson, that we're doing this synthesi synthesizing of doula care with clinical and community partnerships. So, you know, um, Vice President Kamala Harris said this quote, and for so many women, let's note doulas are literally a lifeline. So that lifeline, right? We can go back to the anatomy. We can go back and look at images of that lifeline, which I hear as the umbilical cord and I hear as the placenta. And what I also hear from a public health perspective is that what surrounds us shapes us, which is why the role of community doulas embedded into community health and community development is, is an essential conversation to make giving birth something that every person gets to experience if they want with dignity, respect, and high value. So the last two weeks, many of us got to hear even more passion and commitment, specific in New Jersey, at the Nurture NJ Black Maternal and Infant Health Leadership Summit. And then many of us heard at the National Experience, the Maternal Health Day of Action. So what surrounds us shapes us. We've also been shaped that our state is one of the few states that has expanded paid leave for the birth of a baby, or the, an adoption of a child for both parents, regardless of gender expression. And as at the federal level, the Build Back Better Act is currently looking at how to make sure we have paid leave for every person in the United States. Our state has this and it even expanded, but we're also still surrounded by the impact and trauma of escalating climate disaster. And so we hold with humility that birth does not happen outside of community and environment. And so we acknowledge all of the different iterations that bring us to this conversation and that we are holding. And of course, we have this conversation in the pandemic. It struck me that one of my most favorite doula meetings that was in person was through Children's Home Society. And I actually texted Sarah this morning and I was like, what date was I at your office? Because it was February 11th, 2020. It was probably the last meeting in Trenton I would travel for before my the, the work that I do at Montclair State and every or other organization the next month would close down. So we have this conversation doing this work, knowing that maternity care was one of the first systems to get impacted in the pandemic. And it's not only maternity care that is impacted through the pandemic. We also know through the Marshall Plan for Moms documenting that more than 2 million women left the workforce this past year. They claim the data reminds us that it's 30 years of progress erased overnight, disproportionately impacting women of color. And so we come to this conversation I believe with great hope and great humility. One of the projects that I'm going to seed um, for today's conversation is a project that I was involved in from Ariane Day Labs. And, and I'll give Irina all these resources so the slides can be shared and all of the source citations can be shared. Um, one of the projects was called COVID-19 and 
the momentum for better maternal health care. It's a mouthful, but I'm going to direct our eyes to number three, because there's so many important lessons. This pandemic is exposing how racism is even more palpable, that leaders who have been previously resistant to things like telehealth are absolutely now embracing them. And finally, letter C, there's unprecedented opportunity to advance maternity care by building positive change. And that's what's happening here in Patterson. It's happening, and I use the infographic from Health Connect One because of the community doula care. As defined by Health Connect One, a community doula is similar and integrated with community health worker with even more in-depth training in prenatal health, childbirth education, labor support, lactation counseling, and infant care with an emphasis on trust, continuous labor support, relationships, and home visits when not in a pandemic. And the idea is that relationships matter, and they matter at every moment in our life, but in particular in pregnancy. This is not the first time that Patterson has had community doulas. So this t-shirt that I have a picture of and I'm holding right here um, will be returning to Patterson. It will be sent to Marie and Arellis and Irina. Um, and it was a gift and I really need to make sure and I hope that they're on this webinar, Carlita Singletary and Deborah Pascali Bonaro. They were the heart from 1995 to 1997. And all of these community partners were together in 1995. And it's interesting, right, how some of the names have changed. Northern New Jersey Maternal Child Health Consortium, there was a merger. And so now it's called the Partnership for Maternal Child Health of Northern New Jersey. This project, the Neighborhood Doula Project, was done in support. And look at all of those partners from the Patterson Counseling Center to the FASH, FAS program. St. Joe's, and so their neighborhood doula project was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and later with additional funding from Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Lucky for us, Carlita and Deborah did an entire webinar about their memories and experience that I'll give you the link for because these are living archives that tell the story about centering birth through respectful maternity care and integrating doulas into the landscape. So you can read all about, I'm gonna send the history of the Patterson Neighborhood Doula Project, but I wanna amplify the work of Dr. Sandra Lewis. I actually found her on LinkedIn and I messaged her this morning. Um, and I was like, I'm using your research. Like, um, and so she's, she and I are actually gonna talk on Monday, but this is so wonderful that people who believed in doula care and birth are still part of the experience in New Jersey. So I messaged Dr. Lewis, I'm gonna to talk to her Monday, and I said, I get to use your summary today. In 1997, Dr. Lewis acknowledged the tremendous impact that community doula care had in Patterson. The Neighborhood Doula Project was unique in that it was not only traditional community doula care, but it also had a, a really specific intentional design for perinatal addiction and recovery. And so the doulas themselves had their own recovery journey and were not only community-based doulas, but were also holding shared life experience. So Dr. Lewis wrote, both the doulas and clients, and this is about Patterson, perceived that clients had better pregnancy outcomes, less infants born for positive illicit drugs, less infants being removed, less cesarean birth, smoother labor and delivery. Clients reported they, quote, stayed clean during their pregnancy and attended prenatal care after receiving doula care. Doulas seem to go above and beyond the call of duty in order to address the needs of clients. All participants agreed that the non-judgmental posture of doulas coupled with support, encouragement, and nurturing they provided formed the foundation for substantial gains. The sense of sisterhood developed among the women was also an essential component of program success. And we come back to the art and heart of trust, right? 
and right relationship. Finally, Dr. Lewis wrote, the focus group concluded, women develop strong trusting relationships with each other, helping each other overcome challenges and achieving personal and program goals. Clients became empowered, taking control of their lives, feeling increased self-esteem. Both clients and doulas experienced personal growth and emotional healing, continuing to work towards achieving goals. I'm humbled by that. You can see all of the data. I went for the emotional and the psychological summary, but there's also clinical birth outcome data. And I just have to say that this was not the first time that women have gathered in New Jersey to hear each other and to support their neighbors, their friends, and do community care. Um, I used to run a community doula project in Hudson County in Jersey City. And when I was there, I was doing this project about birth in New Jersey. And I found out that it was not the first time that women were coming to Jersey City to get some type of training. In 1927, there was trainings to bring women to come to Jersey City as midwives. And this is from a book called The American Midwife Debate. And I love that we know some of these names, right? Mrs. A. Larson of North Bergen said it was a splendid course. We have the names of people like Mrs. M. James came to Jersey City from Newark and had to get up at 5 a.m. We Sometimes all we know is a person's name or that a project existed. And what I hope that this can transform for 2022 in Patterson is telling the stories of not only names, but of the experiences in relationship. Um, this is part of what birth looked like in Northern New Jersey, as well as all over the country. This is a picture from the Newark Maternity Hospital in 1917. Um, and remember that maternity care, like most of the United States has seg had been segregated. And so the impact of racism on maternity care is still felt today. And when we look at some of these pictures, um, the Newark Maternity Hospital at the time, of course, was segregated. So in 1914, there were 712 practicing midwives. In 1919, 40% of all births in New Jersey were attended by midwives. And the Department of Health at the time, 100 years ago, was located in Newark. And midwives had lower death rates for infant and neonatals than did physicians. And so at the time, the commissioner of health, Dr. Julius Levy, wanted to know why. And he found that lactation, breastfeeding, was a critical factor about infant, infant health and preventing infant mortality. And that, that the secret was lactation. However, we were still seeing a, a hundred years ago disparities in African-Americans' uh, infant outcomes in 1916. And so the urgency of now is where are we 105 years later is that we still see these same rates of disparities in infant health outcomes, the impact of racism on birth and maternal health, and the critical role that we all have to make sure that every part of this system is centered in equitable, high value care. As we know, New Jersey's infant mortality gap is the largest in the nation, and it is everybody's responsibility, centering art, aesthetics, advocacy, and mobilizing resources so every family gets the equitable, respectful care. So I believe that this is part of this project's work, that we are here to restore the broken agreements, as poet Linda Hogan says, and that this work can be done by everybody with humility and hope. I'll tell you right across the river, the New York City Department of Health has created what's called respectful care at birth. And I'm not talking about this is happening in some other country in a, in a birth center. I'm talking about the New York City hospital system with community partners spent two years trying to understand what respectful care at birth would look like and be experienced for families giving birth. You can go to their website, I'll include it in the resource link, but families and consumers giving birth in New York City hospitals right now really have this accrediting experience that shared decision-making, the quality of care, informed consent, education, 
support, dignity, and non-discrimination are paradigm. It's aspirational. There's a long way to go, but this is at least codified, and I know that we can do the same. When we talk about birth in our country and birth in our culture, there's always these moments, right, that kind of change the conversation. One of the conversations actually was through Ladies Home Journal when a registered nurse wrote in and she signed her, she, she wrote a letter to Ladies Home Journal and she begged the editor to investigate what was happening in obstetric wards at the time. And what you see on the left, that's a picture of what it looked like to give birth um, 1950s, 1960s, even some far up is the 1970s, um, where there was no body autonomy. There was no agency or shared decision-making in giving birth. A lot of times things were done with coercion or without consent. So this article actually really changed the landscape. It got people speaking, in particular nurses that talked about seeing cruel treatment um, but concerned about losing their jobs, and women who knew that they absolutely deserved more humane treatment. And this was a time when birth was moving out of home into hospitals, and what we were losing was that peer-to-peer -peer support. We were losing cousins, sisters, aunts, individuals, and, and all of a sudden people were giving birth by themselves, with a lot of obstetrical violence. And this article changed the narrative along with other people truth-telling, but this one is the one that got the most publicity. And I bring it up now in the year 2021 because the Birthplace Lab did a report just from two years before the pandemic that even right now, one in six women experience mistreatment during childbirth. And so again, to recognize the importance of treating others with dignity and respect is everybody's job to hold the space and to hold the dignity. Because birth in the United States is a complicated issue. I, I, you know, there's so many things on this circle that we could look at, right? But I'm gonna go right for the purple, a birth plan, right? I'm a childbirth educator. So I talk about birth tools and childbirth education, 65% of healthcare providers and staff believe that a birth plan leads to worse outcomes. However, 98% of people giving birth believe that a birth plan equals better outcomes. Just that, just leaning in to the incongruency of what is happening in birth. How can someone find her voice, ask for what she needs, in a very complex system in which there is both staffing issues, in which, in which there's workplace needs, in which the economics impact healthcare, and also the medicalization of birth in which one in three pe people will give birth by cesarean. So navigating maternity care right now is very complex and we don't have easy answers, but we do know that these conversations really help draw communication and help draw resources. There's so many reports. I said to someone the other day, the last thing we need is more, is more reports. But then of course I use your reports. There's so many reports about how to transform this system and how we can do it all in a collaborative manner. Um, so part of what this conversation is, is about doulas. And doulas absolutely, in the narrative of too much, too soon, too little, too late, that is maternity care, doulas absolutely are underutilized for, for improved outcomes. We also look that midwifery is evidence-based but underused, birth balls, water immersion, mobility positions and changes. So, so much transformation can happen that the research is there. Doula care advances the triple aim improving the quality of care, enhancing the experience of decision-making, and shifting healthcare towards cost-effective practices. But it's so complex, right? It's, there's so many circles, there's so many needs. So what do we do with this complexity? Well, I, I turn often to the words of Adrienne Marie Brown, who says, 
complex problems don't have simple solutions, but that doesn't mean there are not interventions that we can make. And so this is a model. Um, in particular, if you're doing any clinical support, I think this model is really helpful because it's the conceptual model of how labor support really helps the entire childbirth experience. And so you can see that there is, and again, you'll get this as a, um, you'll get the PDF of this, um, where you can see that the continuous labor support, everything from um, increased mobility to increased self-esteem, um, improves the spontaneous vaginal birth with better outcomes. And I'm still very struck by Dr. Levy's work from 105 years ago. And we know that lactation, that, that it is the exclusivity and the duration of breast milk that really makes the difference in infant health outcomes. And, and we also know, right, that birth impacts breastfeeding. And there's so many elements and I could just look at this graph all day and learn something every time I look at it um, because the mode of delivery and labor medications can in fact impact lactogenesis one. And that can impact uh, you know, insufficient milk volume. And so all of these things are interrelated. And so we acknowledge the interrelated just the same way we acknowledge community doula care and community development that birth impacts breastfeeding. And there was a really in that same idea about this, you know, what are these, um, what do we do with this information and what is the appropriate role of um, peer support in a very complicated system where as a doula, I get to do a lot of comfort measures, but I don't do clinical care. Um, nevertheless, research found that working with doula care really helps that spontaneous vaginal delivery, absolute timeliness of lactogenesis and less milk supply issues reported at day three. And that's not to say that, um, you know, we don't know what birth will ask of us, but what we do know is that labor support is, is a tool in a system that can be collaborative for improved experiences. That's high value, respectful and evidence-based. I love this infographic from Health Connect One. Um, it's, it says, says all we need to say, right? There's increased breastfeeding rates, decreased cesarean birth, decreased infant mortality, and increased parental attachment. It's informational, physical, and emotional. Doulas are taught to recognize birth as a key life event. And I can look at this picture and I see again, the same intention that all of these conversations in Patterson have been holding, nurturing and protecting a woman's memory of birth, maintaining an uninterrupted presence, recognizing the effect of emotions on the physiology of labor, comfort techniques, positive communication, and promoting early breastfeeding and bonding. The Cochrane Review, gives this that doula's impact have, are more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth and a shorter labor and less likely to have poor outcomes. So that's why ACOG and the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine wrote that continuous labor support by a doula is one of the most effective tools to improve labor and delivery outcomes. But I'm gonna push back on that and say all of the burden of improving maternity care can't just be on peer support. And that's why the integration of community health systems and the integration of doulas as part of the care team um, through a community-based lens really matters. There's no adverse effects from doula care. So now we get to how do we optimize and make sure that doula care is rooted, sustainable, and accessible. And so the economic conversation may be for another day, but what I will tell you is that, um, and this infographic is, is from years ago, but what I will tell you is that there is Medicaid reimbursement for doula care in New Jersey. It's challenged with making sure that the doulas get paid a living wage and that enrollment 
reduces the complex burden, burden, burden and complexity of, an, of provider enrollment. So we do not have a perfect system, but what we do have is the possibility for intentional community doula care. So many of these tools and resources are elevated and are ready in the public domain. One of the most important documents I would recommend as follow-up to this conversation is called Advancing Birth Justice, Community-Based Doulas Models as a Standard of Care for Ending Racial Disparities. It's a report that was written in 2019, and lucky for us, two of the authors live in New Jersey, Ame Brill and Chanel Portia Albert. And this report covers so many strong policy recommendations and the continuity of care to center community-based doulas with the dignity and respect that we want for birthing parents as well. Another place to get a lot of support and technical assistance is the National Health Law Project. They have an entire database specifically about funding community doula care and doula legislation. And again, they, although what started in California, they make recommendations to state partners, they make recommendations um, for access on training, and it's, an, it's a really, really great resource that has so many tools to make sure that the conversations are able to really be centered in best practices. They started in California and they really um, looked at what's called Medi-Cal, but a lot of their recommendations are not unique to California. So this goes back to one of that, that meeting that I was saying that it was like the, the last meeting I was at really before COVID, which was about um, community doula sustainability at the Children's Home Society of New Jersey. And I continue to be so honored and humbled to be part of these conversations. Um, there was such intentionality in doing what was called relationship mapping. And I looked at emails this morning and I took a screenshot and this is in no way a complete picture. But when, when many people were starting this conversation, really hearing each other um, and, and really making sure that trust was centered, that collaboration was centered, um, the integration of services that were already happening in Patterson. No unnecessary cesarean births, um, fostering a bond between trained doulas and moms from their own community. And again, this is a very incomplete list. I took a screenshot and I know I'm not capturing everything. But what I do know is that I continue to see how the design of hearing each other from a plurality of perspectives, not making it one person's job, but making it a conversation that everyone can lean into means that doulas who have been part of Patterson and who are part of Patterson and will continue to be part of Patterson will be absolutely elevated, integrated, and continued for this region. I always ask myself, based on my privilege, how I can care, nurture, and advance health equity and how we can design systems centered on high quality, respectful care that builds resilience. So I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation with my colleagues who are on the line, um, who introduce themselves as we can talk um, from this macro level overview of doulas into what it means for the community partners and citizens in Patterson. So here's my contact information and the slides will be able to be shared. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and mute myself so others can talk. Thank you so much, Jill, for that powerful information. Especially, uh, I see a lot of comments on here speaking of the history of Patterson. I think that was very informative, um, very impactful, especially now, uh, showing that we are working on bringing this doula project forward. So thank you so much. We are definitely looking forward to continue to work with you, uh, Jill. So you will always hear from us um, an email, a phone call. We will always be in touch for sure. So we are open for maybe one or two questions. Let me look at, okay. 
So our first question, what does doula care look like during a postpartum period, especially for black and brown women? Can Marie or, or Carolyn or Irina come on and, and... You know, it's, it's oh, excuse me, let me turn on my camera. It's a coming together. It is making sure that mom has exactly what she needs during that period, that she's able to rest, that she's able to recover because you have to recover from the birth. And this is when, you know, the support comes in, whether it's through the family, the friends, or even the community to make sure that, you know, food is being brought in, that mom is really having an opportunity to sleep and get that rest. And so she can prepare for the upcoming months and just making sure that that um, uh, postpartum visit takes place. There's just so many pieces to this. And, and, and I thank the person who asked that question because sometimes people think, think doula care ends once the birth occurs. No, it is extended through the prenatal period. And so that's my answer. I would leave the rest to my colleagues. Maybe they would like to, um, to answer, to have an answer. Thank you, um, Marie. And that is a great question. Um, our, our experience has been that the afterbirth process is fraught with all kinds of challenges for so many of our moms. And you, you just can't even imagine the breadth and depth of the emotional needs, the physical needs, the, um, so, you know, just the mental health needs. Um, and so we, we've seen that that process being so critical in terms of support, especially the, the first uh, six months after the birth of the child. So this is absolutely um, critical to healthy uh, outcomes with both the mom and for the infant. And I think I continue to, to um, really be uh, you know, wanting to make sure that, that I'm hearing the CDC Hear Her campaign. Um, and the, the post-birth warning signs. And that really changed, I think, as a childbirth educator. I, you know, 20 years ago, I wasn't emphasizing those post-birth warning signs because I, I just, I knew about maternal morbidity and mortality, but we didn't have the data that we have now about after giving birth. And, and so, I mean, that is a shared responsibility um, because it, it matters. And um, I just wanted to add that in um, the programs that I oversee, that's something that we frequently see. We, we don't um, realize that the first few months after giving birth are critical um, emotionally and physically. And what we have seen is that mothers oftentimes are not being listened to and are being uh, disregarded um, with these symptoms that they are feeling. Um, we know that particularly in the black and brown communities, um, many of the symptoms not many, but sometimes some symptoms are somatic symptoms, um, especially looking at the emotional well-being of women. Oftentimes they're coming into the emergency room or contacting their doctor because they're having um, stomach upsets. Um, they're having um, heart palpitations. Um, they're having a lot of headaches and um, you know they're disregarded. And that could be symptoms of many other things, of anxiety, of panic attacks. Um, I know that you know, we oftentimes speak to women that are having edemas, um, infections from their C-sections. And when we ask, why aren't you reaching out to your doctor? The response is sometimes, I don't know how to, especially in this pandemic, where it's either communicating through telehealth, through a phone call, they are just not able to uh, communicate with their physicians quickly and efficiently, or they feel intimidated and feel, well, I don't want to bother them, or I did already call them. And, you know, they kind of said that that's normal during the postpartum period. So a lot of the education that is done in, in at least the programs that I oversee is empowering women, giving them the words to um, speak up and, 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 and ways on how you contact your provider and how you um, transmit the information that you, you really want to share with them. Um, so it is critical that we focus on what you all just said, that postpartum period and how to give um, 
you know, education and words to, to women, you know, right after they give birth. I'd like to add just one more thing. Irene, as you were talking, I started thinking that this is why, you know, when we look at doula care, the doula actually pulls the family into the whole care and can really support the family in supporting the birthing person in that postpartum period. And they may be able to recognize some signs and symptoms and really encourage that, you know, that person move forward with calling the doctor, or even actually making the call. So, you know, thank you. I'm so glad we're having this, this discussion and it's including postpartum because sometimes as Jill mentioned, that was something that people really didn't, um, you know, give a lot of thought to in the past. I just wanted to just piggyback on something else you said, Marie. One of the things we've discovered is that the pre-birth planning is essential to being prepared for post-birth. And what we have found is that, the, that many of the support um, networks that many moms have, a lot of our African-American Latino moms don't have. So pre-birth is our opportunity to plan for the best outcomes post-birth. Absolutely. I also want to share, I also want to add a little bit to what Marie said, because sometimes we are guilty ourselves with our loved ones and friends, where we don't check in on them after the six weeks. They've had the baby, hey, how much does the baby weigh? How's the baby doing? Is the baby sleeping at night? But we forget to ask mom, how are you feeling? You know, how are you adjusting to the new baby, to your new routine? How is that going? Um, and I just want to share that I know at one of our trainings, the facilitator shared a, um, a great idea where when women are having baby showers, a great um, idea to do is have everyone put in a jar or something or a basket, write a note of a way that you will commit to support this birthing person after she has the baby. It can be I'll wash your laundry one day, I'll fold your laundry, I'll keep the baby for two hours while you sleep. And I thought it was amazing because, again, we focus so much on, oh, the baby is so adorable, but we don't know the mental state of the birth in person. So that's just a, another tip that I think was really uh, supportive and we can all maybe take it in when we go to our baby showers or we visit a postpartum person. And in expanding our centering program, you know, we are doing this pre-birth part. We're spending so much more time educating and having um, facilitated discussions around all of these topics. And also on our postpartum floor at the hospital, there's a big sign when you walk in that you know, this is a listen to women from the CDC campaign, just to remind everybody the midwives, the doctors, the residents, to, you know, nurses, to hear what these moms are saying. I just have a two-part brief uh, question, um, really for you, Jill, but um, of course open for uh, Carolyn, because I know you've been so connected to the Patterson community as well as Marie. Um, and as we all know, uh, many of our successes come from the challenges we've experienced, right? So can you identify maybe some challenges that were faced before with the doula project maybe that you would probably um, say, well, these were some of the challenges and maybe some advice that you would say, well, maybe we can try this route instead of facing these challenges again. That's, that's such a super question. Um, and I hope we can kind of dig deeper into that. But a lot of it actually was the lack of intentional coordination. There, um, you know, because so now I would use the phrase that this is very intentionally designed for continuity of care. And previously, as someone who led a community doula um, program, what was happening is that it wasn't integrated, um, that, that we have clinical services that are important and we have community services that are important that are more peer based. But what there hadn't really been is this cohesion, this continuity of care. Um, and uh, that is, I think, what will be successful in this decade, this iteration that we have lessons learned, we have the advanced birthing justice reports, we have um, a lot of experiences in New Jersey, you know, and that there's successful projects that are happening now um, that, that are in our own state, right? So that report out is the uh, intentionality and trust. 
And, and you know, trust is, so, you know, it is easy to use a toolkit that says, you know, here women from the CDC. It's much harder to come to trust. And, and that is that is how these projects work or they don't work. And I, I know it's, it's already working. It's already working. Um, and, and thanks to the people 25 years ago for the incredible trust that they put in with each other and for the, and for the families there. And so I think it's gonna um, look a little different for sustainability um, and integration and, and um, scalability this time. I think one of the other things that, that came up, you know, once uh, the folks received that training and had that experience, there was really nowhere to take that. And, and a lot of that lends to Jill's uh, point. You know, the beauty of the things that we're doing now is now we do have the support of Medicaid. There are pathways for entrepreneurship with women, you know, to say that I want to move forward with creating some sort of, uh, you know, doula network or, you know, and those are the things that I think, you know, Jill brought up that, that idea of sustainability is really key. And to really have all of us to get, come together as one unit to move forward, to really make this, this project work. And I, I believe that the community will feel the support, the commitment and the dedication in this from, from, in this project from the people who are in in um who are working to make it work and know that they as the community are definitely an integral part of really the success of this program i also wanted to add that i think um you know a lot of us oftentimes talk to folks that we know that already support doula care and we're oftentimes preaching to the choir and I think an opportunity that we have here is to bring in non-traditional partners. So um, not only thinking about, you know, um, supporting birthing families, but also um, making this, you know, also making this something that is feasible for families to make a living. Um, off of uh, off of and um, bringing in non-traditional partners such as um, the community um, colleges um, air, um, organizations that work with developing the workforce um, and and you know sections such as as that so I think that you know we have the ability to expand um, you know open up our reach to really bring in folks that usually weren't at the table now um, included. In, in, in the work that we're doing in Patterson. So I think it's it's very exciting. And I, I would um, amplify that by saying, you know, one of the one of the ways that I, I think we really make birth um, a community development strategy is by looking at the first food and by looking at access equity um, of breastfeeding support or not. And one of the strengths of Patterson is the, is the food justice movement. And um, the uh, the community supported agriculture that's happening in Patterson, and so I think you know there's a lot of um, opportunities with non traditional partners as not only what's happening at birth, but what's happening in infant feeding and connecting that to the community um, organizing for food justice. And I, I I echo what everyone has said, and what I sense is this holistic movement. It's no longer you know, us in silos, but it's us looking at the whole person, the whole unit, the mom, the baby, the extended family. And I think we, we are signaling back to our community, we heard you, we heard your pain, we heard your voice, and now we're responding and you're a part of the response. Um, so I, I just love it. And I always say, what better people to have to support your community than your own community, right? We're having people from our own community become uh, trained community doulas and support our own um, versus having someone coming from another county um, to support us that can probably not connect with us, right, as, as effective as someone that's from your actual community. Okay, so we do have a question on here that is the first time I actually heard this question. Um, Jill, maybe you, um, I'm not sure they're asking if adopted parents can have a doula. 
I think that's actually a great uh, question because we often think of the biological parents, right? But adopted parents um, are going through the same emotional uh, states and things of that um, nature. So do you have any feedback um, on that, Jill? I think you just answered it beautifully. Absolutely. <laughs> the journey to parenthood um, is the journey to parenthood. And so it may be less about physical recovery and much more about um, uh, the transition. And I'm so glad Virginia just brought up postpartum doulas. Um, yeah, so there are doulas that really support that infant parent attachment and bonding, normal newborn feeding cues, um, and support the journey of, of parenting and peer support. Thank you, Jill. Okay. So I know we're running for time and I know we wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but we want to definitely thank everyone who is here with us, supporting us. And I just want to point out that this education session is being recorded. So please feel free to share with your circle of friends, community members and contacts. Um, it will be posted on our page at www.pmch.org. And one more thing, I want to remind you all that we are having a kickoff for this project in January 2022. So please look out for the invite for that. And again, we thank you all. We are really looking forward to bringing this forward and, of course, partnering with you all. Thank you all. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Take care. <laughs>